photographer asking me to say cheese, but the last time I did that, they put it on my hamburger. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Welcome to the forum on 420, if that means anything to anybody, but we'll call it <laughs> April 20th. And welcome. Today we have candidates from the school board. Folks, before we get into that, there's a few membership applications at the back. It's fun to tell this group how we're growing, and we are growing with our membership. Hopefully, if this is your first time today, you'll enjoy. And what we're here for, folks, it's really interesting to see people watch television, and, you know, stream media, and try and stay connected to what's going on in the political world. But in our experience, there's nothing that matches the opportunity to see people live, to hear them, and if you're a member of the forum, to be able to ask questions directly. You're talking to the people that are today seeking to get a position to make policy that affects us all. That direct connection is really worth it. I hope you agree. And if you're not members, there's a few applications there. If we run out, talk to me or talk to another board member. We will definitely find a way to give you an application. I guarantee it. Ladies and gentlemen, without further uh, comments, not directed to today, let's discuss the rules a little bit. We have three races for Beaverton City Council, and we have... I'm sorry. I'm going back three years. That did not happen. That was the political joke I was asked to share. So, all these people that are running for school board, thank heaven they know that they're running for school board, even if I don't. Anyway, we have the candidates for the three positions. I would note that one candidate was unable to attend. John Samosa let us know that he would not be able to be here today. The others are here. Please understand, when we're dealing with an election, the forum invites all registered candidates. We are not responsible for those who are unable or unwilling to show, and just wanted to let you know that doesn't mean that that candidate is no longer on the ballot. That candidate would be here if they could. Um, so the rules. Each candidate will have five minutes to present. They will be called up here. I'll call you up. And then after everybody has had a chance to present, then there'll be questions. Members of the forum can ask questions. Don't forget, there's the application forms. Questions will be standing right there. And then if all of the candidates could stand together for the question period, please, if you're a questioner, limit your time to 30 seconds to ask the question. If you have more than one question, great but please go back to the line and we'll get to you if we can. We have a number of candidates, obviously, and I'm sure there'll be a number of questions, and I'm hopeful there's a number of answers. So once again, we'll start off with each candidate having five minutes to make a presentation. Spencer Ehrman over here will be keeping track of the time and he'll be holding up one minute, 30 seconds. Please leave now. No, I'm kidding. Please close, yes. Um, and we are going to hold to those times. When you are up here as candidates and you're answering questions, we've asked the questioner to keep it to 30 seconds. We'd really like each candidate to keep their answers to one minute, and we'll be timing that as well. Guys, it's not that we're that much of a stickler for rules. It's that we want to give everybody a chance not only to present their case, but we also want to give folks the opportunity to enjoy what the forum is here for direct connection with the candidates. We want time for people to ask questions. So, we're going to do zone three first, zone six, and then zone seven. So if I may ask the candidates for zone three to uh, come up, the first speaker will be Melissa Potter, the second will be Eric Simpson. Melissa, would you join us up here, please? With, and Eric, you can... Or you, we would have a chair right here for you, whatever, and thank you for doing that. Whatever you most prefer. All right, ladies and gentlemen, Melissa Potter, candidate for Zone 3, Knox City Council. Thank you for coming today, and thank you to the Washington County Public Affairs Forum for hosting this event. My name is Melissa Potter. I'm running for the Zone 3 school board position because I believe strongly that education has profound impacts on individual students and on entire <coughs> communities. As a researcher, educator, and parent, I have three lenses by which I can see how, in, how policies and budgets impact the classroom environment. In the Beaverton School District, we succeed on a daily basis with many of our students. 
We need to continue to develop the creative intelligence of all of our students and to celebrate our successes. At the same time, we need to critically evaluate programs and policies to address the needs of the students we fail. The skills and the knowledge that our students need to succeed have changed. In our knowledge age, all of our students need to think critically, know their strengths, act cooperatively within groups, and navigate their future in a society that is more diverse and often divided. My experiences give me a unique set of skills to evaluate our system and to know what evidence can tell us what is working and what is not. We need to use this kind of evidence to make informed decisions about how best to use our resources, especially those resources given to us by our community, our levy, and our bond. A little bit of background about myself. I am the first person in my family to graduate from college. My dad was a truck driver, and my parents own a small trucking company that is now successfully managed by my brother. My husband and I have two children, a preschooler and a kindergartner in the public school system. Um, my husband, Nathan, works for the Beaverton School District as the administrator for uh, maintenance services. Starting in 2001, I taught science at Southridge High School right here in Beaverton for six years. I then moved to a teacher on special assignment position. The goal of this position was to listen to the needs of our teachers and to see if we could work with our um, outside partners, Intel, Synopsys, Genentech, Solar World, and Portland State University, to see if we could meet the needs of our teachers with our community partnerships. It was a very successful partnership and I'm very proud to have been part of it. As a teacher in special assignment, I also directed the Beaverton Hillsboro Science Expo. In this role, we brought together scientists and engineers in the community to support and listen and give feedback to students who were conducting their own research. This was a powerful experience for our students to see how the adults in our community care about their education and about their future. Today, with my doctorate in, science, in educational leadership, I'm at the Center for Science Education at Portland State University. I facilitate a team of researchers, graduate students completing their thesis work. I also teach coursework for um, future teachers, elementary school teachers, and um, science inquiry and engineering design courses. By meeting with a full range of community members, educators, and fellow board members, we can continue to build the trust between our community and our educational system. That trust is an essential foundation for us to be able to meet the needs of all of our students. Thank you so much. I ask for your support and for your vote. Ladies and gentlemen, Eric, would you please come up? Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thanks for having me here today. Um, I'm Eric Simpson. I'm a native Oregonian. I grew up in Rock Creek and uh, went to Rock Creek Elementary, Meadow Park Middle School, and I graduated from uh, Sunset High School in 1990. I was raised in a family of educators. My mom was a Beaverton School District science teacher for 33 years at uh, four of the schools, very passionate about science. My dad is a professor of biology at Portland State University, and he was the department chair of biology the last couple of years of his career. Um, I have a lot of science and um, you know, education in my blood, even though I've never been a teacher. I attended the University of Washington, where I uh, majored in chemical engineering, a uh, nice technical degree that um, really stressed me into math and sciences. While at University of Washington, I participated in the 1991 Rose Bowl football team on the scout team. Although my uh, football career was short-lived at uh, UW, I did let her in track three years as a decathlete. So I um, got to do 10 events and worked very hard at college. Kept me grounded. <clears throat> I've been in Intel since 1995. I've been working as a chemical engineer and a technical manager, a technical program manager in various different disciplines, process engineering, facility engineering, and product development. While at Intel, I've learned how to work with uh, very diverse stakeholders, uh, large organizations, I know how what it's like to work on a large team and to strive for good results, with the goal always of the best solution for a problem. And I feel very comfortable working with different stakeholders, such as the board, where there's seven team members, but um, I, I'm also used to working with large organizations, Intel, in the thousands. 
While I was in Intel, they were nice enough to pay for my master's in business, which I did at Portland State University. Um, soon after graduating, I knew I had to do more than just work at Intel. Um, I started up my own doggy daycare business. I had a lot of passion for the pets, the industry, and you know, leadership. I now have uh, four doggy daycare stores, and I manage or lead 30 employees. I have managers that lead also, but I'm the uh, CEO of that business. And we have uh, four stores in Washington County. I've learned many valuable skills as the owner of a business. I know how to get the most out of my people. I know how to work with large organizations. I know how to budget and uh, balance priorities. I feel that my business experience is very valuable for a board role. It would make me actually unique maybe in a board as a small business owner because I know what it's like in tough times, how to make hard decisions, how to work for consensus, and how to move forward. Furthermore, um, I have a lot of energy. You probably can tell I'm a high energy kind of guy. Um, right when I got back from the University of Washington, about my third year of working, um, I became volunteering at the Sunset High School. There was an open position my mom found for a track jump coach, which was perfect since I high jumped at the University of Washington. So I've now been doing uh, track coaching at Sunset High School, 18 seasons and almost 3,000 volunteer hours, which is a, it's a lot of hours, a lot of fun out on the track. But I love it, and that's why I get involved with things I'm passionate with. Also, I've been involved with a small marketing class at Sunset High School. I've had about 20, over 20 hours or 20 classes of teaching small business guerrilla marketing to high school students. I was actually there today for two classes. Very fun. And one last thing I've done in the schools, I've been a tutor. Although I'm not a formal educator, I'm good at mathematics, so I've helped uh, challenge students in math, make sure they're academically eligible so they can not only do track, but graduate, which I think is very important to help all people. Finally, I approach the perspective of a Beaverton School District job role as um, I'm a parent. I have two young children. My wife is a local resident. She graduated from Beaverton High School a couple years before me. We're both very proud of our lineage. We love the uh, Beaverton School District. You know, she was at Sunset. I was, oh, she was at Beaverton. I was at Sunset. Um, we actually moved into districts to Cedar Mill, so um, someday my daughter could be at Sunset High School. Now we have two kids, but um, it actually moved me from Hillsboro to um, this district because um, I already know it's a really awesome system. It's the one you want to be in, and that's why we moved in that area, and we jointly agreed on that. So being in the school board, I feel, gave me a valuable opportunity to use some of the skills I have. Big budgets, work with diverse stakeholders, listening to the community, working for common ground and a good solution. I feel I can do all these things while the energy and passion I have, and I'd be a good candidate for this role. And then that's all. Thank you. very much. Next, we're going to take a look at Zone 6. John Samosa again is unavailable, but we have the other two candidates here, and the first by the draw, we have Daniel Vasquez. Daniel? He's on his way. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Daniel Vasquez. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for joining us today. I apologize for my raspy voice. It's obvious that I have been talking too much. <laughs> Perhaps I should just stop talking. <laughs> I'm running for the Beaverton School Board because having been an educator for over five years, teaching English in East Asia, and also here in Oregon Public Schools, I believe it is important to have the perspective of an educator on the Board of Directors. I volunteer with the Washington County 4-H Tech Wizards where I give motivational speeches and presentations to high school students, motivate them to study hard and graduate from high school, then further encourage them to pursue careers, goals in science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. Also, because I know not all students will go to college, it is important to encourage vocational skills and trades as well as foreign, foreign language proficiencies fine arts and music. I immigrated to, uh, to Oregon from Mexico when I was 10 years old. I did not speak English and there was no English as a second language program. I had to teach myself English. I then attended my junior year of high school in Thailand as an AFS exchange student with the American Field Service and I also learned to speak Thai very well. I graduated from high school in Hood River and went on to graduate from the best university in the state of Oregon. Go Ducks! <laughs> I taught English in China, Japan, and South Korea for over three years. When I came back to Oregon, I continued to teach in Oregon public schools. And having taught in China, Japan, and South Korea for over three years, I was appalled 
at the level of excellence our students here in the U.S. are at. If our students are going to compete with the graduates of Asia, we are going to have to do better than we're doing right now. We need to close the achievement gap, raise the graduation rate, and ensure our students are going to college or vocational training. In 2012, I was hired by the mayor of Beaverton to come start a cultural inclusion program, establish a diversity advisory board, and institutionalize an emerging leaders training program in the city of Beaverton. The work that I did at the city of Beaverton earned a first place cultural diversity award from the National League of Cities in Washington, D.C. I have proven experience. I have the power to transform public education from a former educator's perspective. It is imperative that the Beaverton School Board have a former educator's perspective on the board, and that is what I offer. I also speak Spanish, English, Thai, Mandarin Chinese, Japanese, and Korean. I am culturally competent in communicating with our diverse communities in Beaverton. As you all know, 50% of the 40,000 students in the Beaverton School District are students of color, and over 94 languages are spoken at the Beaverton School District. I ask for your vote this coming May 19th election. Thank you. Handle, ladies and gentlemen, Becky Tim Kipchak, excuse me. Good afternoon, members of the Washington County Public Affairs Forum. Thank you so much for having all of us candidates here today. You can see your dedication to making our community stronger by having us all here today, so I appreciate you, and especially appreciate you joining us on such a sunny uh, afternoon, because we don't get those too much in Oregon. So thank you for spending your time with us today. I had many people ask, why now, Becky? Why now run for the Beaverton School Board? Uh, they see me at schools all the time. And it occurred to me uh, about a month ago, I have been preparing for this job my whole life. Schools are what raise all boats. And I have been a part of that since high school, being involved in leadership, being involved in the community. Then leaving Williams, Oregon, which is in Josephine County, for those of you that don't know, very small town, but I learned there that it takes a community. Everyone works for the same thing in a small community. And that's where my roots came from. Then attended Willamette University, where Willamette University, go Bearcats, is dedicated to promoting being involved in the community. And through that, I was able to get a job at the state capitol. And that's where I really learned how important our communities are. Learning from all of these people from around the state that come together to make our state better. I got to see firsthand how legislation works. I got to see firsthand how people come together to form coalitions to do what is best for our state. And I was so fortunate that I got to work there for three sessions and see firsthand how things work. From there, I started my career in nonprofit work, and that is where I found my true passion. Working with all sorts of nonprofits, people who come together as volunteers, small staff, you have to do all the different jobs. And I worked for a nonprofit called Junior Achievement. And Junior Achievement is an organization that provides finance education in the schools. And I was able to be introduced to all of these schools that I didn't grow up in in the greater metro area and see all the way all these different school districts worked. I got to work with superintendents, I got to work with teachers, and educate them on how these learning targets would be working in their school by economic education. It was a great experience. But Junior Achievement also invested in me to help me with becoming a development officer. And so from there, I became a fundraiser. And for 20 years, I spent working with Junior Achievement throughout the greater metro area, being in school districts everywhere, and getting to educate people from the business community to go into the classroom. Once I left Junior Achievement, I started my own business, and that was an education as well. Starting your own business, having to meet a budget, having to go out and find clients. But I found out that what I had was I loved working with other nonprofits. And so I was able to work with nonprofits throughout the greater area where I'd always meet new people, work with their board of directors, learn about strategic planning, learn about how we can build partnerships to make a stronger community. So I've been doing that for the last 15 years of running my own nonprofit consulting business. 
All the while I was doing this, I was boots on the ground in the schools, not just in my own kids' classroom of helping out with a teacher or helping coordinate teacher appreciation or proctoring an IB test, helping out all of our students because it is our whole community that we are working for. My children have gone to Heighton Elementary, Conestoga, and Southridge. And when we moved to South Beaverton 30 years ago, there was no Conestoga or Southridge. We got to see how this community has grown. And we are now a very, very successful community. All of us that are running for the school board care about kids. But you as voters need to ask the question, what have the candidates done who have no experience running a school board, except for Linda Degman, who is uh, incumbent. What have we done to earn your trust? Here's my answer to that question. I have over 30 years of experience as an individual who cares deeply for our community and our schools. I have personally visited over 35 of our schools, of our 53 schools. I have taught children and I have taught about the private enterprise system. I have served in leadership roles. I have been a part of the Southridge community where we built a community plaza. And I have had a reputation for honesty, hard work, and the ability to bring people together. I am proud to say that on my record, I have earned the endorsement of all the current school board members, as well as every member of the Beaverton City Council, as well as many business leaders. Let me make you one promise. I am fortunate enough to win this election. You're going to find me in the same place that you found me 30 years ago, inside our schools, making a difference. Strong schools make strong communities. Thank you, and I appreciate your vote. Thank you, Vic. Now we move on to Zone 7, where our first speaker is Linda Degman, who I should identify as an incumbent. Linda, please. Thank you, and thank you all for being here today and taking time away from whatever fun things you could be doing out in the sunshine. Um, so just to talk a little bit about me and myself and my family and my experiences, um, my husband and I have a blended family of seven children. Five have graduated through Beaverton schools, um, four from Sunset, one from Merlot Station. We have a senior at Sunset that's graduating this year, and then we have a seven-year-old at uh, Barnes, so we get to start all over again. So <laughs> she's the light of our life, let me tell you. <laughs> so, um, and two of my kids have successfully gone through the two-way immersion program, one at Ridgewood and one at Barnes, and are fluent in Spanish, and the, my little seven-year-old is in and at Barnes currently. So I think the language options are um, something we should continue to do in the district. Um, I'm a first-generation college student, um, put myself through undergrad and graduate school, working full-time and raising a family. I was an adult learner, so I think there's a lot to be said for that. Um, I have a master's in public administration from Portland State University. So, um, I've been a volunteer in the district for 20 plus years, ever since my kids have been going to school here. My husband and I grew up out in the Hillsborough area, and we consciously made a decision to move to Beaverton because of the school district. Um, and we're very proud of that. Um, besides being on the school board this year, I'm also the PTB vice president for, for Barnes Elementary, which is the PTO. We call it the PTB, Parent Teachers of Barnes. So I run all the fundraising for the school. Um, also, I've helped with junior achievement. That was a really wonderful thing to be able to do at Meadow Park. And I, you know, be able to use my economic and finance background to help with that. That was an exciting time to be in the classroom with the kids. Um, they don't learn those kind of things any other way. Um, was on the local school committee when we actually voted in local school committees. Um, you know, chaired two graduation parties for Sunset High School, which was no small feat. Um, and so, and I've also worked extensively on the bond campaign and the levy campaign, and I'm currently the uh, the school board member that's working on the bond account, the citizen community bond accountability committee. So I attend and, and help with that process as well. Um, and the reason that I'm the school board member that does that is because for my daytime job, I work at Portland Community College. I'm the director of the bond program for the college, which at the time had the largest bond program in the state but we outdid them so but I'm on both so it's okay <laughs> so um, you know and working at PCC beyond my the bond program work it also gives me a connection between Portland Community College and the Beaverton School District um, career technical programs um, understanding how our kids can be connected and understand that there's you know what options and opportunities there could be for them after high school because some kids just think there's no options or opportunities after high school and there are 
a lot of them out there that they don't know about. So I always push from kind of both ends, which is really um, a great asset, I think, for, for both PCC and the school district. So why am I running? Well, um, clearly I'm in, in, invested in our community. I'm invested in education. Um, it's one of the things that I'm really passionate about and I feel that it can elevate and change the status of people's lives no matter where they come from. And there's not a lot of things that you can say can do that. And education opens doors and opportunities that, can't, that nothing else I think in our society can. Um, and I'm not doing this because I have a certain specific thing that I want to accomplish, although there are, are a few things that I would like to see happen, and that's the reason I can, I'm running again this time. Um, I've been on the board currently about three and a half years. So, um, so, and I think that I want to be the voice for those kids that don't have a voice in our district. Then we have a lot of those in our district that don't have a voice, that really, from whatever circumstances or wherever they come from in life, and want to make sure that we, um, again, have lots of options out there for them to figure out where they want to go with their life and what they want to do because for us it's really beyond high school and where, where are they going and how do they um, see success in life so um, the few things that I'm passionate about is you know clearly funding um, which is you know class size um, instructional time days you know we are one year behind um, other schools in our country in our nation and that's really not acceptable that our kids get a whole year of less of education from kindergarten or from first grade through 12th grade for technical vocational education we don't have much of that left in our school district um, just because of funding cuts over the years they've pretty much been eliminated for most of our schools and I don't know that we should bring it back the way that it was but you know partnerships with business and industry um, community are clearly things that we should be focusing on um, and, I, and graduation rates, and I think that goes to graduation rates. The more you keep kids instilled and, and invested in their schools, um, they're going to stay and want to graduate because they can see success for their lives afterwards. So, thank you. Um, and we have, I have flyers on the back table if you're interested in it. Thank you for coming. Ladies and gentlemen, the second candidate for Zone Seven, Andrew Beach. Andrew. Fellow candidates, current board members, community members, and Washington County Public Affairs Forum. My name is Andrew Beach. I'm running in Zone 7. Uh, my wife's name is Cindy, and I'm a father to Hannah, Bridget, and Sophia, all products of the Beaverton School District. As a real estate broker and a 14-year district volunteer, I know firsthand the issues that our parents and teachers face and the role of a quality school in strengthening the community. Beaverton is doing a lot of things right, <clears throat> like charter and option schools. Um, there are numerous options here for a lot of folks that other districts don't have. That's a huge benefit. Community partnerships are growing, including faith-based organizations that are filling gaps that the district currently cannot. So I like seeing that. And the strategic planning for a long-term vision is something that the district is really doing a great job at. This 2015 election provides you, the voter, an opportunity to make a choice. I am in full support of the Beaverton goal, which is all students will show continuous progress toward their personal learning goals, developed in collaboration with teachers and parents, and will be prepared for post-secondary education and career success. When you choose Andrew Beach for Zone 7, there's three things I will support this goal to differentiate myself from my opponent. Number one is insulating students and teachers from risky federal education standards and assessments, protecting our kids from vulnerable digital information that's being shared outside our school walls, and supporting expansion of learning options. <coughs> The first one, risky federal education standards and assessments. Schools right now are actually participating in smarter balance tests that align with the Common Core state standards. This grand experiment, supported by virtually no documented <coughs> research, is going to steal, by some estimates, 10 hours from the classroom of instruction that our kids could be receiving. Our overfocus on assessments of this nature are perpetuating a culture of teaching to a test. Children are measured by much more than a score on a test and 10 hours in front of a computer. 
as your board member, I would support parental notification and exemption from smarter balance testing and instead using that time effectively for more instruction and to meet the goal of the district on the individual learning goals. Number two, digital education and privacy are big concerns for a lot of people, not just in the district, but in the community. I met personally with Steve Langford who informed me the district sends, believe it or not, 69 different data sets to the state. And I asked him, point blank, what happens to that data when it leaves our walls? He goes, I don't know. He doesn't know who has access to it, how is it secured, who's, who's it shared with after it leaves the walls of Beaverton School District. We send data or we don't get the funds. That's how it works. As your board director, I will work to support full security of child data, which has required 75 year retention. 75 years they're keeping the data. Number three is expanding learning options. Our family was fortunate enough to win the lottery. Not the real lottery, but the school lottery. And my daughter next year will be attending ISB. I'm often wondering who got left out. There's always more people want to get in than there are space or capacity available. So who's left out? Often, um, to have those options in the community as your zone director, I would look to expand capacity and offer more options to potential students and families. Ladies and gentlemen, you cast your vote on May 19th. A vote for Andrew Beach in Zone 7 is a vote for localized control of education, for enhanced personal privacy measures, and for added support to our option programs. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, if the candidates would come up here, we have six chairs. And of course, if people want to line up for questions, great. While you're doing that, please allow me to recognize we have two guests here today that I just want to spend a moment saying thank you for coming. And over to the left side of the room, that's where they're all hanging out, both hang out. Congresswoman Elizabeth First is joining us today. And we have City Councilor, that's not to be confused with Beaverton School Board, City Councilor Betty Bodie joining us as well. Thank you both for being here. And if the candidates are up and if they would like to be comfortable, they can stand, they can sit, the chairs are there. It's a little tight, I know that. But what I'd like to do is invite the questioners to ask their questions. And again, it's 30 seconds. Um, and then if you would make it clear if you're directing the question to all candidates or a specific candidate, and then whoever would be coming up, just please take the mic and you will be timed again. Have a minute. Thank you, folks. And we're here for the first question. Sir, go right ahead. Jim Cape, four member, question for all candidates. Can you discuss the proposed land swap between the Bill Beaverton School District and the Hillsborough School District? Thank you. <laughs> Happy to go first. Um, you know, we that that's been out there, and as a school board, we have actually not had a, con a school board conversation about that. Um, we really it has to come from the Hillsborough district, not us. We are not going to go in and, and um, tell the Hillsborough school district that they need to do X, Y, or Z or do the land swap. Um, from a Beaverton perspective, if it's something that they want to propose to us and bring forth um, information and have a conversation, we're always open to that, as I'm sure they, if it was the other way around, they would do that as well. So at this point in time, the, us as a school board have not had that conversation. Anybody else feel free? <coughs> would like to go next? Mm -hmm. So as a parent, I understand the need or the desire for a community to, if you live in a neighborhood, to have the kids all go to the same school. I can see how that would be beneficial. But from the school, from the school district perspective, when we start talking about switching our service boundaries, um, we have to be really thoughtful about why we're doing it and establishing a policy that really outlines why we would go forth and make a decision to make our changes to about our service boundaries. 
to be able to provide stable education for our students year after year after year, we want to make sure that it's very predictable about which district the students go to. So if we do make a decision, it needs to be a very clear policy about why we're making the decision and what motivates that decision so that in the future, our families can make plans to be able to support their students. Thank you. Anyone else care to respond? Yes, this is a, a, an interesting idea about swapping land. Um, being a real estate broker, I understand the value of having a quality community that you can actually service. And not only should we not hold this in a vacuum, meaning inside the school board, we should engage community partners, even ask the homeowners that are in that district, what would you choose to do? And so I think it's important to be transparent and open and communicate um, the options to everybody. Um, that being said, um, I would support um, a land swap if it, if it made sense. Thank you. Just to clarify, the candidates do not have to answer a question if they don't have anything to offer or they choose not to. That's why I'm coming back and saying, is there anybody else who'd like to answer? Oh, yes, they did all. I would just like to say as a, as a candidate, the, the wealth of information I have is just what I read in the newspaper. So I do not feel that I have the expertise or the background information to make a stand pro or con on that because I just don't know all the facts. But I also know that Beaverton is growing and Hillsborough are growing at such a rate where we already have uh, a high school like Westview and Liberty just literally a stone's throw away. We're going to be seeing a lot more of this as we are both successful communities that are that are growing out but uh, I would have to wait until I was actually on the board and hear all the facts before I would actually give an answer to that question so my response is because the Beaverton Hillsborough board of directors and the uh, the Beaverton and Hillsborough board of directors have not had that conversation before that perhaps the way to start this would be by having that conversation bringing together the Hillsborough school district and the Beaverton school district in a joint session to address this issue that would be the best way moving forward. To also allow for public comment so that the public could wage in on what the public wants to be done with those land boundaries. Next questioner, please. Thank you. Uh, Phil Nelson, forum member. <clears throat> A question for all the candidates. I know we're very concerned about funding for education, K through university level. But I'm concerned whether or not each of you is in favor of a possible uh, measure or a tax measure to increase the taxation in a progressive way uh, on the income tax uh, side of Oregon residents to uh, fund education. Thank you. can have such a negative term and instead I think what we need to instead of looking at the word taxes or dedication what we need to look at is what is it that we're trying to accomplish what is our end goal and if we as a state say that we value something like education nothing is more important than public education then we need to come together with our state legislators as individual boards come together to figure out how we are going to fund something that we say we value. It's easy to say you value something, but you have to show it by getting behind it. So I'm not quite sure exactly what that looks like, but I do think we owe our students a substantial way and a subsistent way to fund our public schools. So I guess I don't really have a, an opinion one way or the other on, on that specifically, but to go on what Becky said, you know, we, I've been on the board through the, um, all the cuts that we had to do from a budget perspective, and it was painful. It was painful to our students, it was painful to our staff, it was painful to all of you as a community, because at the end of the day, our students are not getting um, their educational needs met, and that's not good for any of us. So whatever we do, we need to figure out how to fund our education in a more consistent way so we're not going through the waves of the ups and downs and having to um, you know, take things away consistently from, from the school districts. So however we do that, we need to find a way together. Thank you. 
Honestly, I have no problem with a graduated tax rate at the higher rates. Um, my wife and I, you know, she's a doctor at Kaiser, and I'm an Intel engineer. Together we understand that um, some of the more of the burden might come our way. Um, we're comfortable with that. I mean, that's just the way we feel. That's the philosophy of our family. It's like her dad is a doctor too. And, you know, um, I think education is important. I don't think the school district squanders money. I think they do well with it. I want to dig in more once I get involved if I get elected. But if they're doing well and our goals are, um, you know, higher, higher standards for the kids, better graduation rates, better results, then heck yes, there ought to be a way to get more revenues and more funding for schools. And quite often that has to be taxes. You know, your question about funding is actually a really good question. I was having a conversation with Representative Joseph Gallegos and Representative Margaret Dorothy, who serve as chair and vice chair, respectively, of the uh, Education oh, yeah. Committee down in Salem. And one of the things we were discussing was that, unfortunately, the pie is not getting bigger, meaning the pie of money is not getting bigger, but rather, how are we going to strategically cut and slice that pie? Perhaps it means getting to gain share money to make sure we get more of that money up here in Washington County, whereas maybe it means getting some of that money distributed equitably across the whole state of Oregon and not just Washington County. But it'll be questions that we'll have to have and talking to key stakeholders like Representative Joseph Gallegos and Margaret Dorothy, who serve as chair and vice chair of the uh, Education Committee down in Salem and who advocate for funds for our schools. So I'm going to tag on to what a lot of folks have said too, um, that we do need that consistent funding to be able to make long-term plans for our students. And part of getting support from our community is helping our community understand what we're trying to do with our students so that we that our community members value what our educational system is trying to do and that they respect the process by which we're trying to do it by using our resources as efficiently as possible. We know we need additional revenue streams. I'm not sure if I have the golden ticket on what those revenue streams might look like, but I think as a school board, we can work collaboratively with our legislators to ask them, what support do you need from us as the educational system to help support the education of our community so that we value what we're trying to do with our students. Okay. Andrew Beach, Zone 7. I don't think tax reform actually falls under the purview of the board. Uh, however, funding is a big issue and having priorities set and understanding how much money we as a district are spending on compliance I can't find that out in the budget right now. How much are we spending on compliance and is compliance with that um, really in the district's best interest? I'm also interested in supporting any kind of legislative relations so that we don't end up getting the leftovers from the state, but we're actually getting um, first dibs, so to speak. And I'd also support some form of a rainy day fund to level out um, the nature of the budget being so erratic. Thank you. Next question to our local author. My name is Bill Kroger. I'm a forum member. Thanks for all of you coming today, and I wish you all the best of luck. Uh, this is for anybody who wants to answer it. Um, <laughs> our statewide uh, dropout rate is pretty pretty bad. That Kate Brown, I think, talked about it at the City Club in Portland recently. Uh, and, uh, and I know all communities are below par. So my question is, is, is you as a board member on the, on the school board, what, what do you think you could do to address the dropout rate itself? Well, that's a really good question, Bill. I know that for here, as a matter of fact, in Beaverton School District, our dropout rate is about 80%, uh, graduation rate is about 80%, and that's about 10% higher than the state average. I remember working myself as an instructional aide in a high school. When you work with students to tutor them in after school programs and encourage them to get more engaged in school, they'll get more interested in school and that raises the graduation rate. So those are things we need to look at. So our graduation rate is low, and especially for certain groups of students, it's drastically low and tragically low. And that means that they aren't able to access opportunities beyond the K-12 system. 
One, I think we need to try to get our educators, the demographics of our educators, to reflect the changing demographic of our, of our community. We have a program called the Portland Teachers Program, which is a partnership between the Beaverton School District, PCC, Portland State, and it pays for a scholarship for students from traditionally underrepresented populations to be able to get them back into the classroom and serve the Beaverton community. At the same time, we need to work with the teachers we currently have and find ways to help them collaborate to be able to make their classrooms more culturally competent so that they can address the diverse learning needs of the different populations that we are now trying to serve. I think there's uh, multiple things we can do to help with that. Some the board can do, some the board cannot help with, but um, obviously you heard earlier that involvement of students in activities at schools is always very valuable. I know that sports and band and all those items are now $250, which pushes some people to disadvantage scholarships and stuff where they give people free services like that to be part of those involvement activities will lead to them staying involved with school. So I think it's very valuable to have those curriculum or items available to them. And as well as like um, the demographics or equity of the district, uh, different populations that maybe they don't have two parents at home, maybe other programs that they're involved with, uh, you know, not always with the school district, but with the uh, organizations that get people involved and keep them going so people don't opt out because I think a lot of teachers do know the ones are going to probably drop out they see a red light and signals that they're going to drop out and they do I think our goal will be to make sure that we intercept those people before they drop out so I think we need to meet our kids where they're at um, you know and part of that is we've done a great job this last year with our 5.5 and our 8.5 summer programs that we implemented so the kids that are going from fifth to sixth grade and um, eighth to ninth grade those are huge transitions for our kids and those kids that are um, most likely to fail we um, put them into those programs and help them be successful over the summertime so when they're going into the next grade level the next middle school or high school they're much more successful and they really um, are on track um, at that point and really just continuing to monitor our kids and really kind of figuring out where they're at um, part of that is staffing resources and intervention and so we um, are investing in those areas as well just because those are really crucial parts of helping our kids be successful Identifying kids that are going to drop out in high school is way too late. This needs to happen K through three. This needs to happen that we give them the strong skill sets in K through three so that they will want to be lifelong learners and know that there is something that they are trying to accomplish once high school is over, whatever that may be, whether that be career, the military, college. But we need to have teachers in classrooms classroom sizes that are manageable so that kids can be identified much earlier. We've uh, implemented a new program at the middle school level called AVID. And this is a way for us to at least identify kids at the middle school that maybe need some extra resources. And we need to look at the advocates, not just for the kids that are in SUMA and some of the great programs that we have at IB and some of this that we have for being self-learners, but those kids in the middle that maybe need some more self-direction. Andrew Beach, Zone 7. Um, I heard from a doctor one time that um, suggesting treatment before diagnosis is known as malpractice. And I think this is actually a symptom of a bigger problem. And until we know the details of the reason that the graduation rates are low, one of the reasons that I understand is that the way we calculate graduation rates are different because we have a modified diploma that's available. So we need to know that first up. And second up, we have a large transient population, specifically here in Aloha, that these people just may move away and that's the reason that they don't graduate. So having the, the specifics of why we have a low graduation rate, I think is more important. Thank you. <clears throat> Terry Bodine, former member and a 50 year resident of the district, two children who graduated from Sunset. Um, I'm a real fan of the Forest Grove School District, based on experience I had within the last two years. A young, a young friend of ours was going through Beaverton, was absolutely going nowhere all the way through middle school. There are a whole bunch of reasons for that. Luckily, he wound up in Forest Grove, and in his senior year, he was part of the Viking House program where kids actually go out and build a house. Your thoughts on that, if, if, if you would? <laughs> Is there a question there? Yeah. 
things. So uh, I guess, you know, that's where it, I guess I'm an advocate for and I keep bringing up career technical education because I think we do a really good job in the district preparing our kids for college. It's all the other things that we need to engage our kids in that keep them in school to help them graduate, like a program like that. You need to find out what the interest of the kids are and there's lots of good examples around the state. Reynolds um, District has a really good, it's called ACE program that does the same thing. It's contracting, engineering, architectural. So it gets kids in, in excited and engaged in other sorts of career options. We have a really great health careers program in the district, so we need to provide other sorts of options and opportunities for our kids like that to help them understand you know, there's something out there for them to find that passion so that they can continue to stay in school and, and graduate when they need to. Ms. Bourdain, I think you're talking about hands-on learning, and uh, that's what things like Junior Achievement are all about. You let a student figure out what they're doing with their own hands and be able to figure that out a little bit for themselves. But I think it again goes back to, we have to identify these students and find out. You said that the person struggled up through, you know, almost middle school. Someone needs to be an advocate, and that's our job as parents to try to be an advocate and know what's best for our student. Unfortunately, at a school district with 40,000 students, we cannot meet the individual needs. We try to do the best we can for as many students as we can. And I think it's great that we have things, options like that this person found their passion at, at Forest Grove, wherever it is, it's public education. Of course, we'd like to keep them here in Beaverton, but I'm glad they found their passion somewhere else. I think I'm gonna drop to a personal story on this one. Um, you know, for my doggy daycare, um, there was a young Latino kid who was uh, 13 years old. He was making a little money doing some side projects with me, and um, you know, high school wasn't really for him. But with uh, my wife and I, as like kind of surrogate big brother, big mom, you know, mom and dad, that he really didn't have in a foster home with five kids, he ultimately graduated from Century High School. But um, you know, college, four-year degrees wasn't for him. He's all about vocational training. So now he's at PCC working on auto shop, auto painting. I think it's good to make sure that you know, you know, four-year college is not for everyone, but vocational training and skills very valuable. So it was really a personal level story, but um, if everybody did that in the world and obviously be a better place. Thanks, and sorry we had to cut that question off a little bit, Harry, but we're pressed a little for time. Please, Chris. Chris Wesley, former member, uh, personal opinion, most kids drop because they can't read well. And that's, uh, could be fixed by remedial reading and things like that. That's, again, personal opinion. But how can you increase the curiosity of classrooms because most of them are boring? <laughs> Let's put it honestly. Uh, I was fortunate to learn how to read when I was very young and I was always curious about the next page. So how can you instill people with that desire? <laughs> It's just for you. No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> um, some of the examples I had, my mom was in the Beaverton School District of 33 years that I mentioned earlier. She was a biology teacher, and they had field biology class in those days, and she was a big advocate of hands-on items. Like, they go out in the field, they plant, collect, they do the press, and they do those things. So I think, you know, sometimes you listening to a lecture can be boring, but usually when your hand's dirty and you're touching it and you're feeling it and you're seeing it, I think that really helped her in the sciences. Um, that's why chemistry labs are valuable, physics labs are valuable, because you're getting hands-on. Um, I don't know if it answers your question about um, early reading, though. Was there a question? So, so I have a personal history with that. My, my little seven-year-old um, struggles in reading. She has been, and so from kindergarten, she's in first grade this year, and through the, chem the summer between kindergarten and first grade, another thing we implemented in the district, she had summer school, which was fabulous. Um, she grew by leaps and bounds, small classes. They get there, they have breakfast, they get to um, you know, have individual, some you know, smaller group reading time, and then, she, and then um, they have lunch, and then they get to come home. So it's kind of you know a camp for them. So I think more things like that that just get students engaged. Um, and she does, you know, intervention is a big thing in our district, and especially reading, because if you don't have the reading skills, you're not going to be successful in anything in school. So that's core to what our kids need to learn. But it's also, you know, figuring out how to make that exciting, and that's why we need our librarians. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> 
Well, the first thing I'd encourage you is to come and visit an elementary classroom because uh, lots of adjectives I would use, boring is not one of them. <laughs> there is a lot of energy going on in elementary classrooms and these teachers are, especially as I emphasized how important that K through three is getting those basics done so they are lifelong learners and are successful. But they are integrating so much of our curriculum so it's not just setting down and reading a book. They are doing things in so many different ways they don't even know that they're practicing their reading skills. They don't even know that they're practicing their writing because they're doing so many fun sorts of things to make learning, learning be fun. But I encourage you to come and visit one of our Beaverton Elementary Schools because I think you're going to find they're not quite as boring as we were when we were reading about Dick and Jane. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I think back about my experiences as an educator, where I think back at my experiences as an educator teaching students, part of the key to making sure the students are being educated successfully is to make sure you have dynamic lesson plans and to make sure the teachers are taking the time to have their prep before their class so that they can have a very dynamic lesson plan. Also part of that as well is the fact that if you look at here in Beaverton, we have three libraries that people can access. We have the Aloha Library, we have the B library, the Central Library in Beaverton, and just most recently we had the library down at the Murray Shoals get a huge expansion of like 1,500 square feet. So students are definitely reading, kids are definitely reading, and they like to read, and it's good that we have programs outside of school, such as the library, that works in partnership with the school district to encourage reading, especially at young levels. Hi, Andrew Beach, Zone 7, again. Uh, this is a great idea that you brought up, this idea of literacy at an early age. And I think it's a larger social thing that we need to be considerate of, that we've now had standards-based education for close to 40 years. And the idea that uh, you can fit a kid in a one-size-fits-all educational paradigm, I think is working against the district goal of having each kid have, have individual learning goals. Um, I would also say that it's part of the um, leadership's responsibility to make sure that the school is implementing classrooms that are fun and exciting for kids to learn in. That might also include um, music, Beaverton Friends of Music, we met with them last night. Having music in the classroom, that would be fun. Having things that kids can do, like art, that would be fun. If you make it fun, they're going to want to learn, and then the reading and the rest of it comes much easier. We do have a lot of evidence that says that early literacy is very important, especially for some of our subgroups of students. We can look at the data and say that if you aren't meeting your reading benchmark by third grade, and we've seen this especially with Hispanic boy students, that their dropout rate is severely affected. And we as a community need to understand and value that we want all of our students to succeed, and we have some programs in the Beaverton School District that help support that, helping teachers find relevant um, reading material for their students. The district is starting to implement the Future Ready School, which is starting to slowly introduce back into the idea of the libraries into the schools, and especially at the elementary school level where those librarians and those media specialists can really work with family members and students to find what makes their heart sing and give them a book that matches it. Thank you. Karen Bolin, for a member, I would be curious to know, and I know time is limited, what grade you would give our superintendent, Jeff Rose, A, B, C, D, and Y? Mm. Is he on the first? No. You go first. <laughs> 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 Well, first of all, you need to know we don't use A, B, C, and D anymore. <laughs> we use one through four on a, uh, and again, as a person running for the school board, my judgment would be made on by things that I read in the paper, things that I see in the community, teachers that I interact with, uh, principals that I interact with. And I think what Jeff Rose has done that in the 30 years that I've been here in Beaverton, especially active in, in South Beaverton, he has given us a strategic plan. He has given us a marketing. We are we. If you see the, the pens with the we, he is a given identity. Now, I cannot speak to it as an actual 
uh, professional educator, how he is with, with, but I think he surrounds himself with smart people. And I think he has a board that is very engaged and he is very, very good, uh, in my observations, in the community. And I think that's an important piece that we need to have that he's a very approachable superintendent. I, for one, would say that at every board of director meeting, the superintendent has a time to address the board of directors as to his superintendent report. And um, it's kind of a, you could say, a monthly check-in that we have from him. And also, you know, keeping in mind that, you know, he is an experienced educator. He has been an educator himself and understands what it's like to be in the classroom. And from the interactions that I've had with him and the hearsay that I've had from people, I would say he's doing a good job. We also gave him a raise, so to speak, last year, and we all remember that. So I'd give, him a, I'd give him an A. I think he's doing a good job. Anybody else? It's a challenging question. This is a challenging question. And um, I, uh, I have some perspective as a parent, as a former educator. I have a lot of friends who went through the cuts and the very famous shuffle where they moved a lot of teachers around and that was very difficult. But I've talked with Karen Hoffman, the union president now, and she has very positive things to say about Jeff Rose, and I value her um, opinion. The school board has a process by which they evaluate the superintendent. I'm not familiar with all of the details of that process and the full evaluation, so I would need to know more as far as a future school board person. I would want to make myself more familiar with what distinguishes the evaluation of the superintendent. So that evaluation process is actually starting here shortly. We always evaluate the superintendent this time of year. Um, you know, being a superintendent in a K through 12 district, especially as big and diverse as ours, is difficult. And I think that people don't necessarily see that. And he's in the limelight all the time. And so people have their judgments about how well he's doing, how well he's not doing, things he could do better. But, you know, at the core, at the end of the day, you know, Jeff cares. You know, Dr. Rose cares about our kids, cares about the district. Um, he does a great job down at the state advocating for us. Um, he spends a lot of time out there. He spends a lot of time at community meetings, engaging the community, communication. Things have improved so vastly over the last few years, so I'm really impressed. Are there things he could work on? Certainly. There's things all of us could work on in our jobs, so I think that that's, that's just kind of a given. So we'll stop at that. <laughs> I think Jeff is very successful. He's doing a good job of uh, his role as superintendent. Um, I like his communication a lot. I like reading the Valley Times and seeing him on the soapbox, you know, advocating for what he believes in and um, sharing what's going on with the budgeting. Always working hard, always down in Salem. So obviously if he's the CEO of the school district, he's working hard for the district. He's putting a lot of time in and he knows the issues well and he's advocating for what he thinks is best. So I give him a big thumbs up. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know how many of you out there know what it's like to be a candidate. I think these people behind me certainly know what it's like to be a candidate, and it ain't easy. So please, give me a round of applause for everybody who's here today. Really appreciate it. Thank you very, very much. Folks, we have an exciting program next week. It's so exciting. Well, first of all, it's a bank school district we're presenting, but let me tell you, there's another item, and that has to do with the uh, Cornelius Fire Initiative, and we'll have the Cornelius City Manager, Bob Drake, uh, Rob Drake, I always get confused between the name Bob and Rob, I don't know why, but at any rate, he will be presenting, and it happens to be the uh, rather timely, not only because we have a vote coming up in Cornelius, but it was the lead editorial in the Oregonian today. Ladies and gentlemen, I'll look forward to seeing you same time, same station, one week from today. Thank you very much, and thanks again to our candidates. Thank <laughs> you.